Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the MIT Scale Global Network Admissions Webinar. Uh, my name is Robert Cummings, and I work at MIT in the Center for Transportation and Logistics, uh, supporting the SCM Blended program here at MIT. Uh, today's webinar uh, will give you a chance to hear from representatives from all of our six uh, Scale Global Network centers. Uh, we'll start off with some brief introductions from everybody here, followed by questions related to the admissions process, uh, and then focused on questions related to uh, student life and the experience. Uh, throughout the webinar, please submit your questions uh, through the Google Hangouts, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Uh, to start off, I would like to introduce the MIT Scale Global Network as a whole. Uh, the network includes six centers of excellence with over 10 educational programs represented here, over 60 researchers and faculty, uh, and then 180 students um, who are currently on campus. Uh, and this leads to over th to thousands of alumni worldwide. Uh, now I'll pass the, line, the mic along to my first colleague, Chris. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Well, uh, I hope that you are enjoying yourselves, guys. Well, my name is Chris Mejia, Mexican, and I'm the director of the Graduate Certificate in Logistics and Supply Chain Management, the GCLOG program. This program is offered here at MIT, and it's very flexible because you actually have four different models. The first model is actually an online model where we will uh, set the fundamentals so that once you arrive to MIT in the second model, you will be able to enjoy all the experience and to keep the pace that is going to be very fast. The second model is actually the July seminar um, you will have around well over uh, 25 different lectures with people from MIT CTL who are going to be teaching you different topics regarding urban logistics humanitarian logistics retail operations etc etc right so afterwards once you need to digest all this three-week period uh, well you will come back to your home countries and then you will need to develop something that we call the capstone project in which you will put into practice what you learn here uh, once you finish this project well uh, you will come back to MIT on January in order to go, uh, well, to stay here for three weeks as well and to enjoy what we call a Scale Connect or the IAP period where you're going to be um, uh, sharing classes, lectures, site visits with some people from other uh, programs in the world from our, from our Scale um, network as well. Um, I think in general terms, that's it. Um, I could uh, supplement some information by saying that uh, this is an important program. What we offer at the end is a certificate that is valid across the world. It has the quality of MIT, of course. And uh, what else should I add? Uh, well, originally this program was only for Latin Americans because this was based on our center in Latin America. Uh, that is located in Bogota, but currently we are offering some seats for people uh, from Africa as well uh, in order to configure this global south hemisphere um, and to face the challenges that all these people have. And as a Mexican, I will tell you that I know that the logistics challenges are huge in these areas, so I'm sure that you would learn a lot for the, uh, from this program as well. So in short, this is uh, for outstanding students um, in Latin America and some seats for Africans. So thank you very much, guys. So, Melanie? Hi, guys. My name is Melanie Winter. I'm the program admin for the master's program in logistics and supply chain management at the LCL, which is the Luxembourg Center for Logistics. In this center that we usually call LCL, we offer a 10-month master's program in logistics and supply man chain management located in the Yahoo of Europe. And so, as my colleagues said, we belong to the SCALE network and offer the same quality as the MIT in terms of educational program. Um, students would start their year at Luxembourg uh, with a, with a four-month four courses, then we'll join Boston for the IAP that my colleague just mentioned and meets all the students from the Scale Center and then come back to Luxembourg and write their thesis, mostly for the summer semester, thesis that is written in collaboration with a local company or company from what we call the greater region that includes Belgium, France, Germany and Luxembourg. I will pass the mic to my colleague Justin now. Thanks, Melody. My name is Justin Snow. I am the academic administrator for the supply chain management residential program here at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it's an intensive 10 month roughly program uh, where students will arrive here in August, uh, participate in orientation program, and then continue on 
not only with their academics, but also an intensive period of recruiting and interviewing for jobs uh, pretty much from the get-go, right when you get here um, in August. Uh, we are in the midst of IEP, which is the winter uh, portion of the program. And then once we reach spring, uh, students are also very engaged in their thesis and capstone projects. We also have uh, study track opportunities. So we have three week long trips, uh, including Panama and two that go to the West Coast of the United States. So we have lots to offer and we definitely pack in a lot in one year. Um, I will also be speaking to the other program that we have here, which is the Supply Chain Management Blended Program. And there are many similarities. They both lead to uh, the same degree. However, the students entering the blended program do begin uh, remotely by completing the MicroMaster's certificate um, and then join the residential students along with the SCALE network uh, in January. So they just arrived uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we will be answering and elaborating more on the items I discussed. So I will pass that uh, now to David. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is David Bayliss, Director of the Master's Program at the Malaysia Institute for Supply Chain Innovation, MISI. Um, a little bit about MISI first. It was launched in 2011 as a joint venture between the Malaysian government and MIT. And as a result, um, we are based in Shah Alam, which is about 30 kilometers from the capital, Kuala Lumpur. So, MISI offers a nine-month program. We have an MIT faculty. We follow the MIT scale curriculum. We have one month, as all the centers do, here at MIT. And we have extensive interaction with industry, um, specifically in respect to job placement, um, as uh, there's a serious lack of supply chain talent in Asia. Uh, we offer scholarships to students with the right credentials. And from a budget perspective, um, we feel that our course program and uh, the cost of living is slightly a little bit more affordable than some of the other centers. Um, so come to uh, MISI, experience a world-class uh, education and discover Asia as a progressive and dynamic world, uh, world leader. Thank you. And I'm going to pass now to... Uh, so hello everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is Marta Romero. I'm the director of the International Master's Program in Zaragoza in Spain. Uh, first of all, I would like to let you know all let you all know that uh, uh, the Zaragoza Center was the first uh, scale center that uh, was established back in 2003, and we're actually celebrating our 15th anniversary next month. I'm um, also here with uh, uh, the students, and uh, this is our 15th generation of the CLOC program. The CLOC program is the uh, the full time master's program, so 10 months like uh, the rest of uh, the programs that you heard from from my colleagues. Uh, you heard about the courses. The curriculum is the same as here at MIT. The only big difference I would say is the electives. When it comes to the electives, students here in the SEM program take uh, more general electives, like uh, they can take some electives at Sloan or Harvard, and our electives are still very much focused on supply chain. Students work on a, on a thesis project. We work with um, multinationals we created back in 2008 a program which is the Zaragoza Academic Partners so we had uh, until now 34 companies that have been sponsoring projects uh, up until now and they also come and recruit our students so big point uh, uh, it's important for us the, the, the recruitment part at least uh, 90 uh, to 95 percent of our students will receive one job offer between uh, during the course or uh, within six months from uh, from graduation and then we have uh, uh, two more projects, uh, two, two more programs, uh, sorry. So one is the, the blended program. So uh, MISI and, uh, and MIT have that as well. Uh, so some of these students are here with us as well. Uh, as they mentioned before, so this is the, the period when all the students convene. So from all the different centers, uh, the different, uh, the different. So after completing the, the micro master, is that our students are required to work on a capstone project. So the students have the opportunity to decide on the topic. 
topic uh, to either have a, a company sponsor the project or come up with an entrepreneurship uh, project themselves. That would be like the main difference. And uh, also the fact that it's a bit strange for us to have our blended students join here in January and not in Zaragoza like we do with uh, with our residential uh, students. And uh, I'm sitting here with Wilson, uh, whom uh, uh, you'll hear about uh, later. Uh, he's my colleague from uh, the NIMBO program. Uh, we have uh, uh, another program, which is called 3C program, which is in collaboration uh, with them. So the students get the opportunity to spend the full term in NIMBO, then uh, come to MIT in January and uh, join us in Zaragoza for the, for the spring term. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, 325 alumni for, uh, from, um, we're very proud of. Uh, these people are great and they are not only uh, very successful successful at the moment, but they also help us uh, uh, all the step. Uh, so they help us uh, during the admission process. They help us uh, securing thesis projects as well as uh, recruiting opportunities. And uh, we'll be happy to take any questions from you later on. Thanks, Marta. Hi, everyone. My name is Wilson. I come from Ningbo Supply Chain Innovation Institute China. As you know, Ningbo Supply Chain Innovation Institute China is the newest member of the Scale Network. On 2016, the government of Ningbo signed a strategic cooperation agreement with MIT and to join, jointly establish the Ningbo Supply Chain Innovation Institute China, an education and research center in China focused on uh, supply chain management and uh, logistic. And we have uh, two degree program. One is, as Mata said, we have the 3C program, and uh, one is MIT Ningbo Supply Chain Management Program. Uh, the Ningbo Supply Chain Innovation, the Ningbo Supply Chain uh, man uh, Supply Chain Management Program is uh, uh, delivers a cutting edge, cutting edge knowledge and uh, experts in program solving change management and uh, leaderships. And uh, we look forward to you enjoy the uh, 2019 intake and uh, welcome to Nimbo. Uh, thank you everybody for introducing your programs. Uh, now we'll move to questions. Uh, first focus sort of on admissions and sort of general inquiries. Um, so we got a few that came in while we were doing the introductions. Um, maybe we could briefly just uh, mention sort of the cost um, or financial support that each program can offer that students can expect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you just want to jump in. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, the cost of the GCLO program in this case is $10,000. Uh, however, we have a network that is the Scale Latin American Network, and the members of this network, uh, they have a discount of uh, 1500 So in this case, they are going to be paying a bit less. And we also provide around like 17 different uh, tuition waivers that go from 25 to 100%. We only have one scholarship of 100%. So the sooner you apply is the better. We have three rounds of application so you can check the rest of the information in the website. So, Melanie? Hi. So the cost for the program in Luxembourg is 24,000 euro for the 10 months. It includes the accommodation for the duration of the IEP in Boston. Then the students have to take care of their own daily expenses and accommodation while they stay in Luxembourg, knowing that the university offers a wide range of possible accommodation for its students. Then we offer um, a scholarship program for our applicants that is open to everyone, regardless of their nationalities, that can go from 25 to 100 person, just like Christopher's. So the current cost of the residential program specifically is $74,200, and then the blended is 60% of that. Uh, we do have various fellowship and scholarship opportunities. All applicants uh, are automatically assessed for uh, two programs, Women in Supply Chain and Scale Scholars. Uh, we also have an opportunity that was new this year, which funds a full tuition and two half tuition scholarships. And that is referred to as the AWESOME Scholarship. And that's an acronym um, related to the organization that uh, sponsors this scholarship in conjunction. And that is specifically for women. Uh, as part of the onboarding process, uh, if you are admitted, we do help to connect you with various financial resources and other institutions uh, that can assist you in financing the education here. 
Okay, so um, the cost of the program at MISI in Malaysian ringgits is 85,000 ringgits, which is just over 20,000 USD. Um, once again, similar to the other centres, we also offer uh, scholarships. And uh, as Justin said, um, regarding uh, women in transport or, or um, supply chain, we, we also um, um, give special concessions to scholarships for, for women. Um, so um, we have um, a, a number of different scholarships we offer within Malaysia that are sponsored by the Malaysian government and uh, various different uh, entities in Malaysia. It just depends on which category you fall into. So if you look at the MISI website, site, you will actually see the, uh, the scholarships on offer. Um, Okay, so the tuition for the CELOC program is uh, 24,000 euros, same as uh, the program in Luxembourg. Uh, we do have a very good financial aid program uh, that includes scholarships and, uh, and a loan. Scholarships, we have different ones, and uh, depending on your eligibility, you can apply for several scholarships. So we have a specific one for Spanish candidates, for European candidates, for African candidates, a special one for women, and one which is more general, which is open to all nationalities. Uh, regarding the bank loan, it's a guaranteed loan that will cover up to 80% of the tuition. It doesn't include living expenses. And um, the 3C program uh, uh, tuition is 28,000 and the uh, blended program is 17,700 euros. I'm afraid that uh, currently there is not financial aid available for these programs. Tuition for the 2019 class of MSCM is almost $25,000 in total of the two years. And we, uh, our program is a two years MBA program. And the tuition include a round trip air ticket to MIT IAP program. And we provide uh, different kind of scholarships. For more information, you can log on our website to know more details. That's all. Uh, great, thank you for uh, answering the questions and sort of giving an overview of our um, tuition structures. Uh, and now we have a few questions about blended, um, the ad blended admissions process. Um, so maybe I'll gear this one towards Marta first and I can always jump in as well. Um, what are the uh, capstone or the project requirements in the application? What do people have to put together um, in order to uh, well, in order to, to apply, uh, you just need to come up with a research proposal of something that uh, uh, you're interested in or something that you're maybe thinking of uh, discussing with your current company. This doesn't mean that uh, it would be necessarily the project that you will be working on when you join the program. Because, uh, for instance, uh, what we do is that uh, we gather together the uh, proposals that you guys are going to, uh, to have in your applications and uh, we're going to also see with our faculty members which are the topics which are more relevant and more interesting. And what we will do is we will uh, pair you up and uh, work together on the capstone project. So that may uh, change uh, during the, uh, the course of the admission and the time that you arrive to the program and in fact that's what we've seen this year. I'll pass it on to Justin because maybe uh, for them it's a bit different. Robert, did you want to attest to this? Uh, yeah, uh, just commenting on um, what Marta said as well for the blended program here at MIT. Um, we do look at the research proposal sort of as an exercise in you putting together a um, uh, topic of research. Uh, we do have the caveat that it doesn't have to be a fully fledged proposal in terms of getting sponsorship from a company um, at the application stage. We would do that over the summer after admission. Um, so you don't have to worry about getting a, a solid commitment from a company um, that early on. And I guess I'll just add one comment to clarify that if you are interested in the residential program, you this is not a part of the application and you uh, will have the opportunity to be provided with a capstone project. Um, so that is something that is sorted out and decided right from the get-go uh, during orientation. That's one of the primary items of orientation in August. Um, yeah, and actually a question for Justin um, that came up just now is, uh, could you explain just a little bit of the, the background and of how the uh, MicroMasters courses fit into the admissions process for the residential program? Sure. So as I previously mentioned, those who complete the entire MicroMasters 
uh, are eligible to apply for the blended program. But what we found is that many student uh, applicants are now applying to the residential program and have either completed the entire certificate or have completed anywhere between one and four to five of the uh, MicroMasters courses. So one item that I'll start off with highlighting is that if you do take three of the courses, uh, specifically the first three, uh, and you do well, and it is somewhat up to the discretion of the admissions committee, you can waive the GMAT and GRE requirement. Um, so this is definitely an alternative avenue that many applicants are taking. Um, I will note that many applicants submit with both. They will have the GMAT and GRE and also um, a few of the SCX courses, which are the courses with the MicroMasters. Um, so your performance on the MicroMasters courses definitely holds heavy weight with the admissions committee. Um, and again, if you submit without the GMAT or GRE, uh, your performance will be on these courses will be judged in lieu of one of those test scores. So definitely, if you are considering taking these courses with the intent on applying to residential, um, make sure you're taking it as a verified student as well. And that is when you would not only register for the course, but pay the $200 uh, fee to become verified. And that's how you take the um, graded leveled course that's required and, and looked at highly as far as from the admission standpoint for residential. Uh, yeah, and it looks like the questions are flowing in faster than I can get them. Um, so just to point out, if we don't grab everyone's question, we still have the, a log and we'll answer them after the webinar. Uh, but just some ones that have come up since. Uh, one question for Marta. Uh, do students applying to the uh, PhD program in Zaragoza need to first complete the master's uh, in order to apply? No, that was a requirement before, but uh, it's true that uh, uh, due to the uh, Bologna regulations, you would need to have to be a holder of a master's degree. So that would be a, a requirement for you to enroll in the program. Uh, enrolling in the CLOC program will not grant you direct access to the PhD program. Uh, and a question for Melanie for the program in Luxembourg. Uh, do students have to be proactive in finding companies um, themselves for your research projects? No, that would be um, that would be provided by uh, the center directly. We make a uh, work of partnership with local and company, uh, local and greater region companies, and then we have a matching system to to find the best uh, matching between the company and the student's profile. Excellent. Thanks for explaining. Um, yeah, just some questions about uh, test scores. Um, if anybody just wants to chime in of what uh, range of GRE or GMAT scores uh, that you might consider for your uh, programs, uh, maybe if we start with David. Okay, so um, for from MISI's point of view, we actually take the full package into consideration. And so if somebody has a lower um, GMAT score, um, but they have a good uh, GPA, they might have MicroMasters, they could have Lean Six Sigma, um, they could have all sorts of other good um, experience in supply chain they could have a number of years in supply chain so generally speaking if uh, they score higher on these other areas then it's possible that we can lower the uh, the grade slightly for the gmat score but average gmat score at the moment is anywhere between is around about 620 to 6, 6, 660 for um misi um but we do we do go slightly lower dependent on the full package that a student a candidate has to offer. Excellent. Um, yeah. Anybody? So on the website, um, we have posted minimum percentiles for specific sections of both the GMAT and GRE. So for the verbal and quantitative sections, it's the 75th percentile, and then the analytical writing is the 50th percentile. Uh, similar, piggybacking off of what David said, we do review every application that comes in. Um, we do take a holistic approach to reviewing applicants. So, and I get this question a lot, if somebody is slightly below a percentage, they ask if they can still apply. And I, I encourage all interested applicants to apply um, because again, you're not gonna necessarily be disqualified. Um, but again, just keep in mind that we are looking to see um, and 
evaluate whether you'll be able to excel academically here. Um, so that's a lot of the reason why we have and you know, look for these test scores. But like I said, if we can find other areas of your application which attest to strong quantitative abilities, such as in your academic background, or like I had said with the MicroMasters courses, you know, that could potentially make up for a, a weakness or something, or a score that's slightly below one of these percentages. If I just may add, so same as uh, for the SEM and the program in, in Malaysia, uh, we also take into account uh, that if you guys come from an engineering background, uh, you can send us your transcripts and then we can assess whether or not we can waive the GMAT or GRE uh, requirement. Excellent. And that's actually a perfect transition to um, some more questions that we have related to work experience. Um, some students have asked uh, if they don't have work experience in supply chain, is that still okay? What sort of um, experience would you be looking for? Um, I can throw it to Melanie if you like that. <laughs> Hi. So, um, as David said just earlier, we will also look at the general picture of your profile. and. We already accepted in the past some students that didn't get any professional experience, but just for instance, a six month um, traineeship in supply chain management. Uh, that would depend if you have excellent academic performances, that would compensate. And if you have excellent motivation, that could compensate as well for some work experience. That was for Luxembourg. And also I'd add that um, um, on their submission, if they have a passion for supply chain, this will also count quite highly because you have to have a passion for anything you want to do in life. So that's a big consideration as well. Okay, well, in the case of the GCLO program, what we do is, uh, yes, of course, the work experience is, is very important. But again, I just, just to build upon what my colleagues mentioned, yes, we consider also the passion and things like that. I just add, I just would like to add something else. And it's for those professionals who were recently graduated from a master's or a certificate in their home countries, again, Latin America or Africa, you are also eligible. And what we consider there, sometimes we take into account if you have been recently updated with these courses from the micro masters or if you are, have, have been involved in, in similar things, right? And to close the loop, again, talking uh, regarding the experience, well, the most important part is uh, not only the passion, I could say, but I could add also that that's the advantage of the supply chain management. Right, so you can have accountants that are developing and understanding better the the cash flow, and and the same happens for the physical flow and the information flow. So we really believe in the GCLO program that you can have a very good fit here. Yes. I just wanted to add um, a little bit in general, and kind of going off what Chris said, that um, I get questions a lot, uh, sent resumes. Again, we. We definitely don't want to discourage you from applying if you don't feel that you necessarily have a supply chain background because we do get people from a broad spectrum of industries engineering operations consulting family businesses so um again it's oh it's always great to receive resumes and and um you, you can certainly reach out to us and ask more specifically with your situation but i did want to note that um the, our program is designed for early to mid career level professionals. So most successfully admitted applicants do fall in the three to eight years of work experience, not necessarily a supply chain experience, but just in general. Um, and again, that's, that's speaking for here at MIT. But again, we do have outliers. So um, we have people who are later in their careers and people with just two years of work experience. Uh, and on that same note, um, uh, for the blended programs, um, we also consider applicants from more of a non-traditional background, so they may have significantly more work experience. Um, so that shouldn't be a deterrent either. Um, Marta, if you have. So for our programs, uh, it's true that uh, we uh, um, request for a couple of years of experience to join the SELOC program. But as Melanie said, uh, uh, also if we see that uh, there is a recent graduate where, where we see the potential, uh, we would admit him. In fact, uh, one of our current students is only 23. And as for the uh, blended program, which the profile is uh, the people are a bit uh, uh, older in that sense, and uh, they have uh, many more years of experience, we have someone who is 
is uh, 55. So for us, uh, learning is uh, it's a lifelong learning experience, and uh, we welcome uh, either students uh, with uh, little or, or not relevant experience in supply chain, or people with uh, more than uh, 15, 20 years in supply chain. Uh, diversity is very important, not only uh, in the uh, regarding the nationality, but also the work experience that uh, the students bring into the classroom. Uh, thank you. And um, as we think of more aspects of the application, uh, it's worth pointing out that we have two um, dedicated application systems, um, one for the residential programs, or actually three, one for the residential programs, one for the blended program programs, and then one for the certificate program, which is a GC log. Um, and applicants can apply to both residential and blended uh, applications in a given year. Um, so you can apply to all the programs if you've taken the MicroMasters. Um, I know that was an earlier question. Uh, one question that's um, uh, moving on to other components of the application, uh, TOEFL and English requirements. Um, can um, you speak to some of the uh, requirements that you have? Yeah, for, for Malaysia, um, we're obviously governed as many of the, con uh, the other centers are by the government regulations. And Malaysian uh, regulations are such that uh, um, if a candidate comes from a, a country where the first language is not English, um, then they'll be expected to have TOEFL or uh, IELTS. Uh, so, for example, if you came from Australia, which is uh, an English-speaking country, you wouldn't need any uh, TOEFL or IELTS. Similarly, if, you, um, if your degree is not taught in English, um, then you would have to have TOEFL or IELTS. So we, um, as I'm sure the other centres, we don't have any discretion on gov government policy. So it just depends on what country you're from, who you are, and what the government uh, regulation is within each of the centres. Uh, <clears throat> at MIT, um, we do also require the TOEFL and IELTS for those individuals that uh, English is not their native language. However, we have a little more flexibility if you did uh, earn a degree uh, from an institution where English is the primary language of instruction, um, whether that be for your undergraduate or master's. Um, you can select, and it's really just a box on the application, uh, request a waiver and we will um, assess uh, whether that's granted and you know reach back out to you if we need further information after you submit your application. Our requirements is same to the Justin said and uh, we provide addition course in Chinese so you come to the Ningbo Center we will teach you Chinese and you know more and more people want to learn Chinese so we you can learn both supply chain management and Chinese in Ningbo Center. We also take into consideration whether the candidate is living in an English-speaking country or has been working there for a while. If there is a doubt, uh, we conduct a phone interview and uh, we know that uh, taking TOEFL is time-consuming and it's also expensive. So for those people who have uh, uh, this experience abroad and uh, are working uh, with English-speaking people, then uh, then we can, of course, consider waiving the requirement. We also accept, accept uh, IELTS, uh, Cambridge Certificate, uh, all kinds of uh, English certification. Well, just to clarify, for those interested in the GC Log program, the same that was mentioned by my colleague Marta applies here. We know that it sometimes these tests are expensive, so we waive that depending on the profile that you have. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and um, to wrap up our admissions questions, I know we have a lot still coming in, um, but just one more component um, to mention is the video statement. Um, can anybody comment on a few key points that they take into consideration when reviewing applications? So, and before I begin, we do have a few pointers on our website if you want to check them out for the video statement. Um, we, of course, want to hear your answers to the prompts that we have, but at the end of the day, we also want to get a feel for who you are as a person, your personality. Um, you, you don't need, uh, need to feel like you have to produce this very impressive studio video. Um, you know, you can just set something up 
at home on your phone. Um, we really are trying to just get a feel for who you are as a person and get to know you. Um, so, so th that's my best advice. Yes, and also do not read from the screen on your computer. We can tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think those are some great tips. Um, so why don't we, we, I've collected a few questions uh, related to student life and sort of the experience, the education aspects. Um, so um, one question that came up is, uh, do any of your programs offer part-time opportunities? Um, and can you speak to that if it's possible to work during your program? Part-time opportunities for the full-time master students? Yes. Um, well, at uh, MISI, we actually do have a part-time program which operates at the weekend. So what we do with some of our full-time students, um, they attend some of the part-time courses and similarly, some of the full-time students attend, uh, that attend the part-time and the part-time attend the full-time. So we in interact both sets of uh, courses. We also have evening courses. So at MISI, when we have visiting faculty from MIT, we always insist that they teach the courses in the evening. And this way, then we have the full-time students and the part-time students attend. So at the moment, we have about 140 part-time students. Um, and so they will interact with the, uh, so we, we blend the whole lot together. Great. Uh, we also have a part-time program, but this one is mostly taught in Spanish. So 80% of the classes will be taught in Spanish. It's taught uh, uh, three times a week. So on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And that's uh, so that uh, it will allow time for the Spanish people to join the program after they're done with their work uh, day. Yeah, and then Justin wants to just comment on what people can expect with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so at the programmatic level, we officially don't allow students to work just because it is so intense as far as the academics and the recruiting and everything that we have as far as the program. However, um, we have 40 students um, from a broad spectrum of industries and they also you know, have a broad spectrum of capabilities and situations. So we can assess on a case-by-case -case basis um, if that's, you know, something that needs to be done or, um, is of interest, you know, we can have discussions once we're at the point, um, of admission and we're working on onboarding. Okay. Maybe just to emphasize what I mentioned at the beginning, well, the certificate is actually for part-timers, right? That's why it's split in these four models starting on, on May. Uh, then you will come here to MIT, as I mentioned. I'm, don't, I'm not going to repeat, but then this is for part-timers, and this is actually the, the most attractive part for, for the program, right? This flexibility. Yeah. And uh, our two-year program divided into two parts. The first year is course study, and the second year we will provide many opportunities to you. You can choose the industry partner in our institute. You can have many time to be an intern. And if your performance well, the company will offer you, uh, give your offer. And you know, China is a big marketing in many industry like eco economic and uh, mobile phones. And you have many chance in China. Yeah. And also in our program, so you won't be able to work while you're studying, first because of the workload, and uh, second because you will be in the country on uh, student state, so that won't be a possibility for you to work and, and study at the same time. So as many people have pointed out here, um, since working is not an option, you'll be spending most of your time taking classes um, and working on your capstone projects. Uh, could you just explain a few of the courses, uh, the academic requirements that um, students might expect, um, the number of courses or hours that they could expect working. When in Luxembourg, the classes are usually uh, following business hours, so let's say from 9 to 5. Uh, we try to keep one day free of classes for you guys to work on your physics project, so that would be a small piece in the winter semester, so from September till December, mostly collecting data for the physics, but the most part of the writing up would happen in the summer semester after you come back from Boston. So uh, for the residential program in the fall at MIT, uh, you're taking a lot of the core courses, um, supply chain database, 
uh, supply chain finance related courses, uh, you do start the full year length sequence for the capstone thesis. Um, so you hit the ground running and you often will be visiting the sponsoring company for your capstone. Um, so, and again, the fall, a, lo a lot of the focus is definitely on the recruiting piece um, and interviewing for jobs. As we move through into IEP, um, it's a little more non-traditional. Uh, there's lecture style um, opportunities, um, group group project um, opportunities to collaborate with people from across all of the centers. Um, spring is more for electives. So we have electives ranging from machine learning, procurement, um, humanitarian logistics, environmental logistics. So the spring is definitely more of an opportunity for you to explore a little bit some of maybe your more niche interests. Um, I believe someone mentioned before, but students at MIT do have opportunities to take courses outside of this SCM department. So um, the Sloan MBA school uh, is definitely an attractive option for students. So there are options to take elective courses um, with Sloan students as well. Well, at MISI, as I said, we have uh, evening classes, weekend classes, and the residential during the week um, classes. Um, normally, the weekend classes are electives, similar to yourself. Um, but uh, the days that uh, the students uh, are working at the weekend, they'll have one or two days off during the week. Um, so they'll also uh, be expected to work on their thesis projects. The thesis project is sponsored at MISI uh, by various different companies, um, which also follows up in February with an internship, a one week internship. Um, so we put a, a matrix together for the students to follow, which gives them two or three days a week to be able to work on their thesis project. Although they might be attending classes, full day classes, full one day classes at the weekend uh, with the other students. Okay, so in Zaragoza during the fall term, so students are going to, to be taking uh, most of the core courses, uh, same as the other programs. So the focus here is uh, systems and methods. As they mentioned before, so now that we're all here together at MIT, the focus here would be uh, leading global supply chains. And when we come back to, to Zaragoza in, in the spring term, uh, the focus is more specialization. There will still be a couple of uh, core courses, but that's the period when we offer our electives. And also it's not going, we're not going to have so many courses in the spring so that the students can focus on their thesis project as well as uh, looking for job opportunities. Yeah, the main course is the same to the MIT, the same course. But as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, our program is an MBA program and our course also include uh, some MBA course like uh, behavior organization and uh, marketing management. And well, in the case of the GCLO program, well, basically the first module is like 30 hours per week, given that you will be taking these online courses, then uh, you become, let's say, a kind of full timer during the um, uh, visit to MIT on July and also in January. So you will be, you will have full day classes. And in the case of the Capstone project, you will need to invest around like 30 hours as, as well, right, during four months. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and now some other components of um, student life at your campuses. Um, where do students tend to live in on-campus housing and what sort of cost of living can they expect in the cities that um, your universities are located at? I'll be the first one to respond to this. So we have recently moved to uh, to the city center in, in Zaragoza. So that's going to be uh, way easier for the students to access with uh, transportation available uh, for everyone. And uh, also uh, living in Spain is not that expensive. So you should account for a budget of uh, 600 euros per month. That would include uh, uh, securing accommodation as well as utilities and, and food and transportation. Um, I would say our um, costing is a little bit less than, than uh, Zaragoza. Um, all our uh, students at MISI tend to stay in one big complex area and they have the opportunity of sharing an apartment with somebody, having their own apartment, having uh, three to an apartment and uh, 
it's actually near a shopping mall as well, which is quite handy for them. And then every single morning we have the Missy coach, which brings them from their complex to the to the Missy campus. Um, at the same time, talking about uh, uh, other, other things that they get up to at MISI, we'll have cultural events that we'll take them to. Um, Malaysia cultural events or even the orchestra in the Twin Towers. We take them to various different uh, areas in Malaysia and also they will visit whether it's one of the ports, Port Dixon, we'll take them to Malacca, take them to various different places while they're here in Malaysia. So there's no getting around, it's quite expensive here in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> I will say because of that, most students do live in on-campus housing. Um, it is still relatively expensive, but um, many of the off-campus options can soar up even beyond that. Uh, there's an application process that begins around the end of March for admitted students. I believe about 98% of applicants get housing, but it's not 100% guaranteed. Um, I get that question a lot. Uh, there are different options depending on if you are want to live by yourself, if you're coming with a family, et cetera. So there's apartment style, um, single rooms. Um, again, there's a whole website that you can check out um, related to the different options. As far as off-campus housing, some students do choose to live this. They might have a family member already living in the area, which is convenient. Um, the immediate Cambridge area is quite expensive, um, but there are more affordable areas in the greater Boston area. But um, that would require some travel. So we do encourage students to live close to campus just because um, uh, students that live further away find it cumbersome to go back and forth. Uh, and just to put a solid number on that, um, during the visa application process, um, the MIT recommends a budget around $1,600 per month um, in, in terms of uh, housing, food, supplies. Um, so just to put in in perspective. Well, I'm pretty sure Luxembourg can compete on the prices of Cambridge <laughs> in terms of accommodation. Um, we recommend an overall budget of a thousand per month, including housing and daily expenses. Most of our students tend to live in Luxembourg City. Uh, I don't know if you realize, but Luxembourg, the country is quite small overall. So even if you live in the countryside, the prices don't really go less in terms of prices for accommodation. Um, it's also quite mainstream in Luxembourg City to share flats, not only for students, but also for uh, young professionals. So this is an option that some of our students also picked. And as I said before, the university has a good good offer in terms of accommodation from just dorms up to apartment for four or five people. Well, in the case of the GCLO program, given that you will be here during three weeks on July and three weeks on January, well, the arrangement is a bit different, right? We have agreements with certain hotels. I'm not going to mention the, the brands here, but uh, but in general, uh, they are pretty close. Uh, this is pretty convenient for all the students. And in terms of the budget that you will need to add for your cost living expenses, you would need to add to the cost of the program around 6,000 more just to give you an idea that includes includes probably your tickets from your flight tickets i mean um the accommodation or the lodging and also your your expenses here in order to live to eat something and enjoy your life here um there are few options where you can uh, stay uh, only with your family by yourself in the hotel room or you can share with two or three other people right <laughs> Our center will have a new teaching building this year. It's a very beautiful building, and uh, we will provide an uh, apartment for every uh, overseas students. And uh, we have two students' restaurants shared by Ningbo University. So don't worry about your living con con conditions, only focus on your study. I just forgot to say that uh, we have a person in the center that is uh, dedicated to helping the students with several issues. So accommodation would be one of those. 
And uh, we've been lucky in the past. That means that uh, we've been renting apartments from landlords and uh, the state that the apartments that uh, the students left them uh, after they left uh, means that uh, they did a good job in uh, keeping the, the, the apartments uh, nicely. So we're renting those. So we have like a database of apartments. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, maybe when you reach Zaragoza, you would need uh, to stay for a couple of days in in a hotel or in in, in an Airbnb, but uh, that you guys can move in into a permanent location uh, pretty fast. Uh, same goes as for the other programs. So you can either live on your own or share with uh, with classmates or even with other students from the university. That's uh, totally up to you. Yeah, at MISR, we're virtually the same. We have a dedicated person that deals with uh, housing for students and uh, they can send the photographs and all the, uh, the information. The only difference is, is we, uh, we can uh, coordinate it so students, when they arrive in Malaysia, they're taken directly to their accommodation. That's the only difference. Excellent. Um, so now moving on to another topic, um, sort of post-graduation is uh, what can students expect in terms of recruiting opportunities or work authorization um, in your respective countries? Yeah. If you want to start with Justin. Uh, so as I mentioned, specifically for the residential students, there's a lot of on-campus recruiting and interview opportunities. Um, Apple, Amazon, Flex, uh, consulting firms, there's tons and tons of companies that come. They give presentations, um, kind of just an overview of the company, um, and then again, opportunities for interviewing. Uh, as far as students here on a visa, um, this program is considered a STEM program. So you can apply for and qualify for uh, one year of OPT, um, optional practical training, and then you can extend that for an additional two years through the STEM program. So this is definitely a great opportunity that our students take advantage of, um, and that's something we assist you with along with the International Student Office. Um, there's still lots of recruiting that happens right now uh, during the January period as well as in the spring for both the residential and the blended students. Um, we definitely have alumni hubs uh, in the Bay Area um, around San Francisco and uh, San Jose out in California, as well as Seattle um, out in Washington. So um, we try to, you know, connect alums with current students um, through those networks as well. Uh, MISI, it's very similar. Um, we bring in our business partners and generally speaking, they will give a one hour presentation first to the class. And then this will normally be followed by um, either selective interviews where they've selected from the resume book or they will interview all the students. Um, I'm glad to say that last year, every student that uh, was looking for a job was offered at least one, two, or in some cases, three different positions. Um, so similar to Justin and the same with all the centers, we take uh, 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 um, job placement extremely seriously and it's a big part of our program as well. But we have to put emphasis on the fact that we help the students or that we help the candidates to find a job. Sometimes the candidates or the student um, feels that they uh, might be entitled to a better package, so they might turn the job down. But generally speaking, um, we have placed at MISI every student last year. Okay, so in Zaragoza we also have a person uh, who handles uh, career opportunities and who's helping the students uh, with uh, the resumes, with mock interviews, so on. Uh, we start with the recruitment cycle in uh, in the spring, well not the spring, but in February when we come back from MIT, mainly because uh, companies in Europe uh, do not interview for a position and uh, they keep the position like uh, open like uh, usually uh, happens uh, here at MIT that the students start interviewing right at the beginning of the program and that uh, that's a cause of panic among our students when they come here and they hear that uh, many of the students in the SEM program uh, have got uh, job offers. That being said, uh, we tell the students from the very beginning that uh, looking for uh, for a job is the responsibility of the students. However, we're going to try to bring as many companies as possible on campus. 
uh, these companies can be the sponsor uh, of the thesis project, also alumni who are uh, recruiting. And uh, as David uh, mentioned, so we circulate our resume book and uh, we have the companies come and present. And that would be the, the idea. And I'd just like to add to that, and I'm sure it's the same with all centres. We actually train students on how to write a generic resume and how to write a cover letter. And similar to what Marta has said, we also give them tuition into um, the technique for in the interview technique as well. So we do help the students at the initial stage. I am just a question for Melanie about your recruitment process. Um, do, stu do students need to know French or German in order to get those positions in your area? Well, that's a tricky question because <laughs> actually Luxembourg has three official language, French, English and German, and also Luxembourgish, which is more a dialect than a proper daily language used, knowing that um, around 40% of people in Luxembourg are ex expats. Um, it's definitely an asset to have more than uh, English, let's say. Uh, what's good is that the university through its uh, language center offer co uh, language courses for the students at a very reduced price. I believe it's like 20 euro per semester for language courses. Uh, great. And there is one specific question just about support for blended programs versus residential. Um, I feel like I can speak to that. Uh, uh, the blended program at MIT gets the same level of support as our residential program. Uh, the only thing we mention is that we cannot offer um, too much dedicated support prior to enrollment. Um, so for the blended students, uh, you do have to be a little bit more proactive in seeking out opportunities um, since you'll have a smaller window of opportunity um, just beginning in January. Yep. And if Marta, I believe um, you have the, the same support for both, yes. both cohorts. Yep. Uh, excellent. Um, so now we're starting to um, get close to the end of our time. Um, we had a few more admissions related questions that I'll just follow up real quick on. Um, so one is uh, when somebody applies, how long after um, their application can they sort of expect a turnaround? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have three admission rounds. So um, at this moment, uh, for the remainder of this cycle, uh, if you apply to multiple centers, you, although we you can apply um, through the one system, um, we do have separate processes. And so you can expect to hear from us individually. Um, although, of course, we're in communication and you know can coordinate um, if you have a specific situation or specific questions impacting um multiple centers um but for the most part you'll hear in a range between two to four weeks um after any given admission deadline um if you have specific questions for any of the centers um about admission timetables and maybe um an exceptional situation or you know feel free to reach out to one of us because we, you know, that that's our role. We want to help you um, and answer your questions that you have about the application and, you know, help you get that application in. So definitely reach out to one of us. I don't know if anyone else is something no, else. That was a good answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, and on that note, um, as a reminder, our um, second round application deadline, first round for Blended, um, all begin is in just uh, two weeks, February 7th. Um, so we're looking forward to getting a great group of applications. Uh, we'll be able to respond to questions via email after this. Um, I see there's still um, a few questions, uh, very specific um, from our audience. Um, so thank you for tuning in or for uh, tuning in and giving uh, those questions. Uh, and we'd like to say thank you again. Um, there's anything else that anybody would like to say? Yeah, just just one comment. Well, in the case of the deadline of the second round for the GCLog program is closing the 1st of February. Okay. Just, just that comment. Yeah, I don't know. Anybody else? Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you again. And remember, you can email scale at mit.edu and this webinar will be available um, immediately after we're done today. Uh, thanks again. Bye. Thank you, bye. bye. bye.